Hello, welcome to the town hall. I'm Charlotte Yates, the president and vice chancellor of the University of Guelph, and welcome to uh, the town hall. Um, I do believe that Dr. Tannenbaum has joined us, Gwen. Uh, Kim, can you confirm? Yeah, I'm just looking to Thank see you. if he's online now. Okay, so as you all know, uh, today we're going to be discussing plans for the fall. So to start us off, I like to turn it over uh, to Aaron Miller, who will be emceeing the event. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, President Yates. I really appreciate it. So I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity to welcome uh, everybody to the uh, the town hall. Uh, my name is Aaron Miller. I'm the uh, Director of Marketing and Digital Engagement uh, here at the University of Guelph, and I'll be uh, acting as a uh, MC or moderator for uh, for today's event. Um, I think the digital engagement section of my uh, my title is is really relevant for uh, for today's conversation uh, because we're anticipating there'll be a lot of uh, a lot of questions, uh, a lot of people who want to um, have a voice heard. So we're really uh, really working hard to ensure that everybody has that opportunity, and we're going to do that in three kind of key ways today. Um, we're going to either uh, answer all questions live here today through uh, through questions that were either pre-submitted or in the uh, chat. Um, we'll also be answering questions on the chat. So if somebody has a question that could be easily answered by some of our team working behind the scenes, they'll be answering those questions uh, inside the chat in real time as well. And then if some of the questions uh, we don't get a chance to answer, um, you we're gonna post the answers to all of those on our COVID website as well. So uh, we're really trying to make a, uh, a really concerted effort to ensure that we're answering all questions um, and everybody certainly feels heard from, uh, from any kind of uh, issues or questions that they do have today. Um, and I also just wanted to uh, make a, a quick hat tip as well to the team who's working behind the scenes on this. Um, we've got a lot of people who are going through all the questions just to make sure that uh, that we get ev all of them answered. So as you can imagine, with the, uh, with we, I see 902 people already here today, there's probably going to be a lot of them that are going to uh, are going to come up today. Now, why are we doing a, a town hall? Uh, it really comes down to providing you with an overview of what the latest plans are for the university. Um, and also to, as I mentioned previously, to answer those questions that you have that might be um, might be kind of uh, hanging around in your head. Like as I think about it, we're weeks away from, uh, from students coming on campus and there's always a lot of questions, not only here at the University of Guelph, but all across Ontario and across Canada. So it certainly makes sense that people would have some questions. So that's why we're we're here doing this today. And really what, what it's all about about is there's a we have a goal to ensure that we're going to be able to create really safe and enriching on-campus experience for everyone for students for staff uh, and for faculty and that's really the the goal for all of this now in terms of uh some of the engagement that we're going to be doing today we did receive some uh pre-submitted questions that we're going to have some uh we're going to probably start with first and we certainly appreciate those who uh who had the time to do that um you're going to see that sometimes the questions might be asked in themes because a lot of the questions were, were very similar about uh, about specific topics so we're going to ensure that we we answer the questions it may not be exactly how you worded it because there were probably others who had a similar question as well um but for those of you who didn't have an opportunity to uh, submit a question previously. Like I mentioned before, the chat function will be open so you can ask your questions in there. Um, and then again, in time permitting, we can uh, try to answer all the ones pre-submitted and, and live. Before we uh, totally get started on everything and get into some remarks and uh, and into some uh, engagement from our audience, I just wanted to thank our whole executive team. So obviously, uh, President Yates, uh, Dr. Kate Dewey, Dr. Malcolm Campbell, uh, Daniel Atlin, Sharmila Rashid, as well as Dr. Matthew Tenenbaum from the Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health uh, for being here today to help answer all these questions. Um, and then I want to ensure that we have a lot of time for the questions um, because I know that's going to be the uh, the main part of today's uh, today's event. But I did want to uh, put it back to uh, President Charlie Yates so she could give a, a few words to uh, to open up the event. Thanks very much, Sharon. And uh, let me start by saying welcome, everybody. It is wonderful to connect with you all virtually this afternoon. Uh, and I do want to remind us that as we gather virtually, I encourage us all to take a moment to reflect on the lands on which we all reside and those that connect us as part of the University of Guelph. Guelph resides within the lands of the dish with one spoon wampum and on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. 
we recognize the diverse communities of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples who call these lands home today. With this land acknowledgement and the others that we do at all the functions at the university, we are acknowledging our relationship to the land, to communities and our actions. And we also reaffirm the University of Guelph's commitment to decolonization, anti-racism and reconciliation with indigenous peoples and lands. Let me turn with a brief, a few brief remarks uh, on the fall term. Uh, and then um, well, I know that uh, Aaron will turn it over to Dr. Tannenbaum. So I know, we all know we're weeks uh, away from the beginning of the new academic year and I am excited to uh, see people. I already started uh, yesterday, I saw a few more people, a few more former friends, colleagues. Uh, and of course, it's exciting to think about uh, activities and experiences resuming on campus. But I also know a lot of us feel anxiety. There's a lot of concerns and uncertainties about resuming more on campus experiences in the fall. I want to assure you that the health and safety of the University of Community continues and has always been a guide to our decisions. So as we prepare for the fall, we've been working uh, diligently to ensure the campus facilities as well as our practices meet all public health guidelines. All of you will have received a letter this morning and if you have not seen it yet, you'll be able to see it uh, on our website. As part of these practices, the University of Guelph announced this morning that the university will be mandating vaccines for students, faculty and staff in order to access our Guelph campuses, Bridgetown campus and the indoors at all UG managed field stations. This mandate will be in place for the balance of the 2021-22 academic year. This decision was made by the university's executive team with strong support from Wellington Dufferin Guelph and Chatham Kent Public Health. We know that being fully vaccinated significantly reduces the risk of most serious outcomes of COVID-19. And to date, this has also been true for the variants of concern. I'm sure Dr. Tannenbaum will be able to share more information of this when I turn it over to him. Vaccines are now readily available across Ontario. And in making our plans, we've ensured that the university community members uh, will continue to have access to vaccinations through student health services, pop-up clinics, and of course, the provincial portal. Um, we are uh, in all of our measures mitigating risks uh, to our campus community, but as you all know, we cannot uh, completely remove all risk. Uh, I am continuing to advocate and work closely with the Council of Ontario Universities, which is lobbying uh, government for action, uh, and in particular, we've been lobbying government to introduce a vaccine passport and to support us in our expectation for mandatory vaccines. So far, we've been able, unable uh, to get the government to act. And for that reason, it has come up to individual institutions to a, take action on their own. It's important to note that individuals who cannot be vaccinated based on medical or other grounds recognized by the Ontario Human Rights Code can request an accommodation. As you can imagine, operationalizing this vaccine mandate at the university will require widespread institutional consultation and collaboration. We will be engaging various groups across Senate, I mean across the university, including Senate and the Board of Governors as we develop details of this plan. There will be a special Senate meeting called late in August for consultation, and we will be providing notice to members shortly. We don't have all the answers today, but we are working hard to get those answers, but also your questions today will be important in shaping what issues we need to address in order to continue to make our campus safe. We will keep track of all the questions posed so that they can continue to shape details of the plan. And of course, we welcome questions for today's town hall on any topic related to our return to campuses, not just the vaccine mandate. We will continue to keep you informed regularly as new information becomes available. 
I want to thank all of those who have provided guidance on this decision and all of our decisions on pandemic related issues for your work in keeping our community healthy. I do want to end my remarks with a note of gratitude. Last week we had a celebration uh, to celebrate the uh, community COVID-19 vaccination clinic that we hosted at the University Center um, and that closed last week uh, because of the significant progress made in vaccination rates across uh, Guelph and of course the availability of vaccines other than in large vaccination centers. Vaccinations will continue to be offered throughout the community and on our own campus through student well, uh, health services as well as pop-up clinics. I am proud to say that since the opening in March, the University of Guelph Clinic administered more than 83,000 vaccinations. We had dedicated medical staff, we had dedicated staff who made sure that the campus uh, clinic ran smoothly and supported the health and welfare of our community. I want to say a very big thank you to the Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health, the Guelph Family Health Team, and our own U of G staff and hundreds of volunteers for making uh, this clinic such a success. Now I'll turn it over to you, uh, Aaron, uh, to introduce Dr. Tannenbaum. Thank you, President Yates. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Matthew Tenenbaum, Associate Medical Officer of Health for Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health. And Dr. Tenenbaum has been working with the health unit uh, as a physician uh, consultant since September of 2018 and was appointed Associate Medical Officer of Health in January 2019. Uh, through his role, he works to ensure public health services in the region uh, are impactful and responsive to the local needs. Um, Dr. Tenenbaum, we were very, very grateful for your ongoing support of the University of Guelph. Uh, we thank you for joining us this afternoon. So uh, welcome to our uh, town hall. Thank you very much for having me and thank you for everyone who's on the call with us today. Really appreciate pre the chance to talk about where we are as a community, what we might be able to expect in this fall, and what we're thinking about as we enter this next phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I want to thank the university for, for hosting this town hall to provide a forum to be able to have those conversations and to have as much reach as possible because we know there are questions out there. We want to make sure we give everyone the best possible information to understand what's going on, to understand the level of risk that exists and what they can do to protect themselves and the people they care about. I'm not going to take very long, but I did want to speak for a few minutes. And I'm going to see if I can share a, a couple of slides just to help guide the conversation a little bit. But uh, I'll begin by talking a bit about where we are in our COVID-19 response uh, overall and within WDG specifically. So essentially where we are is we've gone through this pandemic for a year and a half now. Of course, everyone remembers our first wave in the spring of 2020. Then we had a quiet summer. And then of course, a very busy fall, a very busy fall leading into winter with our second wave. And then it's like again in our third wave this past spring when the alpha variant of concern became our dominant uh, COVID-19 uh, variant and that drove a significant increase in uh, cases, hospitalizations and bad outcomes from COVID-19 given how easily that one spreads and how uh, severely it can impact people. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic isn't over yet. The numbers have come down since that third wave and overall within our community things have been quieter with fewer cases, fewer hospitalizations, lesser impacts compared to where we were. But we've also learned over the course of the past year and a half that COVID-19 is a, a challenging adversary and it is certainly not done dealing with us yet. We know there is a good likelihood of cases increasing again in the fall. We've already begun to see provincially some increases in our case numbers as we enter the coming uh, season. We know people are going to be spending more time more time indoors and as with other uh, respiratory viruses, we do expect there to be some increases. Now I'll speak a bit later about the impact of vaccines, but those are of course a key tool we have in our tool belt which modify the risk that exists in our community and they represent a key action all of us can take and all of us can recommend to others around us to take to reduce the risk that we face as a community going forward. Uh, on our website, wdgpublichealth.ca, we maintain a dashboard where we have our key indicators that you can understand the risk that exists on any given day. And we do update it every weekday with indicators like our confirmed case trends, our estimates of our reproductive number, and our positivity from our testing that happens. 
All of those trends are really worth keeping an eye on as we enter the fall to understand the risk that we face. And certainly they and other indicators are ones that we're gonna be watching very carefully as we give our best advice in response to changing circumstances. Right now, of course, things are much lower, representing the lesser impact that COVID-19 has had since the downslope of that third wave. But as I mentioned, we are paying very close attention because we are seeing provincially some increases in trends, which could represent the beginning of a fall wave ahead. Of course, you'll likely have heard from us in many different fora by now that we are really, really emphasizing the importance of getting vaccinated. We're fortunate not just to have multiple vaccines available in our community, but to have those vaccines be incredibly safe and effective. And we have them now in such quantities that we're able to offer both first and second doses to anyone who's eligible who wants to receive them. We've moved from really prioritizing the vaccine to those who are most at risk back in January and February to now being able to offer it to anyone 12 and up who's willing to walk into one of our clinics. And of course, it's not just about our clinics, but we are now making sure that people can access vaccines through pharmacies, primary care settings, pop-up settings. And over the course of the past year, uh, the clinic at the University of Guelph has been a huge, huge component of our overall vaccination strategy and has led to many, many doses given, many COVID cases averted, and many hospitalizations and death of, deaths averted as a consequence. We know now that the cases we are seeing are predominantly among those who are not vaccinated or who are not completely vaccinated. The number of cases we're seeing among those who have gotten their two doses is incredibly small. And that really speaks to the effectiveness of these vaccines and the importance of getting vaccinated if you haven't already. We're fortunate that we now have over 80% of people in our community who have gotten their first dose and about three quarters of people who have gotten their second dose as well. We do want to get those numbers up as high as we can. We are not done with our immunization rollout quite yet. But if you or someone you know is someone who hasn't gotten their vaccine yet, please, please, please do get it. We want to make it as easy as possible to get because it does make a difference to you, makes a difference to those around you, and it makes a difference to those in the community around you. Again, I mentioned that we had prioritized vaccinations and gradually expanded the groups of people who are eligible and who are able to receive the vaccine. We're fortunate right now that we have across all the eligible uh, age groups within our community, very high coverage levels. Of course, highest in those older adults, we were able to roll things out first, but even among our younger populations, we're 70% you know, plus first doses with a significant majority of second doses across all these age groups. We do wanna get those higher. And in particular, if you're someone who's in that younger age group where we're seeing 70, 72% coverage, we're really imploring you to get vaccinated if you haven't already, because we wanna get those numbers as high as we can and to get those numbers as even as we can across all of our age groups, because those numbers represent the risk that exists in our community. And as we're thinking about who's gonna be returning to campus, we wanna make sure that everyone's immunized, that they can get immunized. Again, looking at within WDG as well as Gulf specifically in that youngest age group, we have, as I mentioned, uh, you know, between 70% and 75 or 76% of people who are vaccinated with their first dose and over half of people uh, with their second dose of being fully vaccinated. And it's that fully vaccinated number that really makes the biggest difference. We know that with Delta variant as the variant that is dominant in our area now and that will dominate, we expect this fall, it is a variant that really relies on you having that two dose level of protection. And so we want that second column of numbers, the fully vaccinated figures, to really get as high as you possibly can and to encourage everyone to get not just a first dose, but a second dose if they haven't already. We do try to make getting your first or second dose as easy as possible. And there are a number of ways that you can access vaccines in our community. You can book online through our e-portal on our website, and there's a link there to that um, portal. We also have links to it from the homepage of wdgpublichealth.ca. You can give us a call at 1-844-780-0202 any weekday between 8 and 8, and we'll also book something for you over the phone if the web option doesn't work well for you. And of course, any of our clinics that we're offering, you can drop in and get your first dose or second dose. We wanna make sure it's easy and convenient and it doesn't pose any more obstacles than it absolutely has to, because we know how critical it is to get that last you know, 20% or so of people in our community uh, immunized so that we can get things as high as possible and limit community risk. 
Finally, as I mentioned, it's not just us and public health and partners that are running clinics, but also pharmacy and primary care providers who are offering vaccines now. And there is information available at covid19.ontario.ca where they can list out exactly which pharmacies, for example, are offering a vaccine. And of course, you can contact your own primary care provider about their availability to give you a vaccine if that's your preferred way to access it. I'm just going to end off by talking about the key things that all of us can do to ensure we have the safest possible return to campus. Obviously, I've been talking a lot about the importance of getting vaccinated, and that is the most important thing to do if you haven't done it already. We are asking you to get the COVID-19 shot yourself, but also if you have gotten it, to encourage those around you to get the COVID-19 vaccine. We know that as much as we can talk in public health about the importance of getting vaccinated, people who haven't gotten it yet are much, much more open to hearing about it from people who they know, who they trust, who they have existing relationships with. And so if you care about having a safe community and a safe campus this fall, please talk to people you know who are hesitant or haven't gotten the vaccine yet about the importance of getting vaccinated because it is the most important tool in our tool belts as we enter the times ahead. Of course, things like wearing a mask and physically distancing are key measures that will continue to be important because we know that um, not everyone's gonna be vaccinated at all times. And COVID-19 is something that, that can spread through close contact. And those key measures we've been talking about for a long time are still important with where we are in the pandemic right now. Of course, if you're feeling sick, staying home is important and that applies whether you're vaccinated or not because we wanna make sure we're keeping our campus and other environments as safe as can be. And we wanna make sure that um, we are really engineering all these settings to be as safe as we can make them. Uh, it's not in the slide here, but I do wanna recognize, of course, the great leadership taken by the University of Guelph in mandating COVID-19 vaccinations for those who are entering campus. That is gonna to contribute to a safer campus environment this fall. It's a great step that we in public health fully support. And again, it speaks to the importance and the impact that the vaccines have for those who are going to be in our campus as we enter the fall months. So please, to make sure that you have not just safety and provide safety to those around you, but to make sure you have a successful year ahead um, as a university community member, please, please, please do get vaccinated. And if you have any further questions about the vaccine, please ask them on this call or please contact us in public health because we're happy to get you what you need to make sure you feel confident getting vaccinated. I'm just gonna end there with my prepared slides, but I'm happy to take questions that come up during the town hall today. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Tenenbaum. We really appreciate all the support you've offered uh, the University of Guelph, and uh, and we really value the great partnership between public health and uh, and the university. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, so now, I guess it's time for us to uh, to move into the uh, the question period. Uh, I would just again to reiterate what I said off the uh, the top. So we are taking we have pre-submitted questions that we're bundling some of those just for uh, time purposes because a lot of them were had very similar themes. Um, again, the chat is also open, so if that's an option where you have a question right now, we also have people who are monitoring that and will uh, will give questions uh, to us. Um, unfortunately, we only do have an hour today, so uh, I guess with, without further ado, I'll start the uh, start the first questions. Uh, the first question that came in is for uh, Vice President uh, Rashid. Said, so what is the status of building ventilation assessments on campus? Sharmila, you're on mute. Sorry, had to do that live. Um, thanks, Aaron. I'll just I'll give a general overview and then I will pass it on to Steve Nyman, our director for maintenance and energy services, to get into details based on specific questions we have received over the last several weeks and and as well for this town hall. So all our buildings are running on maximum outside airflow, including units for, uh, for offices, classrooms, seminar spaces, and teaching labs were specifically assessed due to the occupant um, proximity and loading and will run with a threshold of six equivalent air changes per hour. Well over 200 classrooms scheduled for this fall semester have had ventilation measurements and assessment completed through the physical resources maintenance and energy services. We have achieved the six effective air changes per hour, either through actual air movement or augmented by air purifiers for all the assessed spaces. 
All of these are listed on our COVID-19 webpage, which we updated this morning. We also added a quick link so it's easy to access and have added some ventilation um, FAQs there that came true from people across our campus and specific questions. If any other spaces are added to the fall semester um, for utilization, we will continue to assess those. I will quickly pass this over to Steve to get into details on the ventilation, but before, before I do that, I just want to add and reiterate it um, because those things are being asked about other safety measures, about mask and physical distancing, hand hygiene, etc. All those are robustly in place here at the University of Guelph and all updated on our return to campus web pages and are in line with public health guidelines. So over to you, Steve. Great, thank you, Vice President Rashid. Uh, I'm just discussing some points of interest uh, and some questions and conversations that uh, have occurred. Uh, there were some questions on process of how we did this. Um, we uh, we basically have uh, opened the um, ventilation devices to achieve the uh, the six air changes, and I want to stress that it's six outside air. Uh, changes and in places where we could not achieve the six outside air changes, we are using air purification units um, that have the capability of uh, duplicating outside air through HEPA filtration and UV treatment. Uh, and HEPA, sorry, stands for high efficiency particulate air filters, uh, that they're uh, um, a well known technology to uh, uh, create the equivalent of outside air. And so there was some concern about um, the status of those settings that uh, as we do measurements, um, we leave those devices and these are devices that are typically in the in the ceilings of classrooms that they're left in position so they'll maintain the measured airflows and um, there is a quick link to the uh, the results that we've posted and it's also on the physical resources um, web page for anyone that wants to check a specific um, space. Uh, you know, through uh, everyone's research, you might see a, a, a reference to demand control ventilation, and that's typically an algorithm that uh, building automation follows to vary the amount of ventilation, uh, be it outside air, return air, that type of thing. Um, that's being disabled, so the uh, the use of outside air um, is uh, uh, that it, it can't be uh, can't be changed. The measurements uh, were done by our own trades workers uh, in conjunction with um, consultants that have been certified by the National Environmental Balancing Bureau um, that they've worked together to uh, to do this work. Um, so the the actual purification units, uh, there was some question around those of whether they were noisy, um, whether anyone could tamper with them. Um, if you wanted to actually look up the unit, there's Sanuvox S300. Um, they're very quiet, 59 decibels uh, at five feet, and there really is no adjustment. Uh, as I said before, they use HEPA filtration and UV treatment, and they're basically uh, on and off. And uh, there was some concern of uh, classroom spaces that uh, perhaps had some questions related to HVAC uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, we would encourage that, uh, that you submit your requests um, to the work order desk. Uh, the, the work order desk purely for the reason that um, that's the best way for us to triage um, problems that are reported on campus and the staff at the work order desk um, do have a framework in place of how to distribute that those requests uh, to the rest of us in physical resources. So that's the, the most effective and efficient way to actually um, get those requests uh, looked after. Uh, some questions about the six air changes. Um, that was a number that um, through research, uh, so uh, ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, um, it's, it's a, a level that was intended for medical treatment rooms. And the reason that we chose six, six changes was to deal with variation as well, that uh, the, the actual recommendations for classrooms and educational facilities is lower. 
but to have a very robust answer that could uh, accommodate some uh, changes as we went through the pandemic, um, we decided to work to the higher standard um, that existed for medical facilities. And so uh, six, uh, six air changes with outside air uh, or the equivalent of outside air is a very robust standard and uh, does accommodate uh, some ability to uh, uh, react to uh, or not need to react to uh, changes as they occur. Um, for in terms of the, the best practices, the documents and research, um, there's, there's some Harvard University studies that uh, are often uh, cited in, in pandemic situations. Um, they had recommended four to six air changes for classrooms and universities within those studies. And as I said before, that uh, ASHRAE um, pointed to six for medical examination rooms and treatment rooms that uh, might involve uh, aerosols. Steve, Steve, I'm sorry uh, to interject, but uh, you've given such a, a great detailed answer to this, but we have a, a ton of questions coming in. So would it be possible just to kind of wrap up with something uh, to, in conclusion and then we can uh, move on because we're, we're getting a ton of questions coming in through the chat. As luck would have it, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Good timing then. Good timing. Thank you again so much to uh, to both of you for uh, for those answers. Um, the next question is going to Acting Provost uh, Kate Dewey. Um, please describe the science behind the 60% face-to-face target for the fall, as well as the 250 person per classroom cap. Will classrooms have a population density target, or will 250 students be packed into a room of 250 seats? Thank you very much for this question. Um, I will, uh, I'll start with the 250. <laughs> so as we all know, um, over this pandemic, public health directives have often included reduced numbers of people in a given air, airspace. Uh, while we didn't have um, uh, or expect such a directive for the fall, um, Provost Gwen Chapman chose to limit classes to 250 students um, primarily um, to avoid having classes that were bigger than 250 because as we know we have classes that could be you know four or five or five or six hundred students um, so by limiting the number of students um, that has actually limited the number of students in an airspace um, so what um, by doing so we were able then to put our biggest classes into classrooms that were much larger than the 250 um, limit with an idea that we would have um, a larger airspace for the largest classes. Um, as we filled classrooms, we filled them from the biggest classrooms with the big, biggest number of students to the smallest. So that, that does not mean that we had a specific density in mind. Um, we used um, the, the large classes to the best of our ability. Um, and as far as the 60%, um, I think I need to take you the, back to the very beginning. Well, the aim was that students were coming back on campus. And the aim was to give as many students a face-to-face -face class opportunity as possible. We, we are expecting that students will come back on campus and we are trying to give them a fulsome campus experience. In our discussions, this was particularly important for the first and second year students coming onto campus. As we know, the second year students had a remote learning experience last year, and the first year students will have had a lot of remote learning during high school. So we wished, we wished that to happen for our students. We also aimed to have every student in every program have at least one face-to-face -face course. So those were the principles that we used when we were um, designing the fall semester. Um, the cap of 250 students um, became a limitation for us when it came to first and second year classes because often those are the classes that, that are the largest. So many of those classes actually were reverted to um, remote learning classes. And so the 60% that we were aiming, that, that, that we ultimately aimed for was, was probably lower than we had hoped for in the beginning. But given that we were limiting class sizes to 250, 
Um, that and and that um, that as as everybody knows, we have some very large first and second year classes with multiple sections. Um, Sixty percent was where we were able to land once we had the the um, the courses scheduled. Um, we are hoping that every student still has an opportunity for face to face um, class, and for some students that is not necessarily a lecture, but maybe a seminar or a, a lab given a course that they're taking. Hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, Kate, appreciate that. Um, the next question uh, that's come in is for um, President Yates. Um, we've had several questions come in the chat about why this decision of the vaccine mandate had been has been made now and not sooner. Thanks very much, Aaron, and uh, thanks for the questions. All of you who know me who participate in these events, I do try and uh, keep track of the questions. So I've been watching uh, as questions emerge. So uh, this isn't a surprise to me, obviously. So um, why now? Uh, why not? Um, I can tell there were some people very frustrated. We didn't make it weeks, months ago. So let me explain why now, and then let me talk a little bit about uh, enforcement versus attestation. Um, so let me start by saying we have been advocating loudly and in collaboration with all the other universities across Ontario, uh, with government, uh, the government of Ontario, to in fact uh, give us leadership in terms of a vaccine passport or some kind of green pass that would allow us to monitor vaccination rates on campus, but would also support us uh, in requiring uh, vaccines. The government has chosen not to take that step. And as um, we've been monitoring that, we clearly uh, have to then take action in our own hands. And for that reason, the last week, 10 days, you've seen a cluster of universities uh, coming out with very, very similar plans. Why now? We've been watching the environment and as has happened throughout the pandemic, the environment has been changing rapidly. Uh, it's changed, as Dr. Tannenbaum said, between, uh, you know, kind of the first, second, third wave. And now as we watch the Delta variant, we see growing evidence of the um, spread and the contagion of the Delta variant. So that's one of the factors that we had to consider in thinking about making mandated vaccines. The second is watching the vaccination rates of our uh, young population. And again, uh, we're very fortunate in, the, in, in Guelph. Uh, we have a very high rate, relatively speaking, of young people. And from all surveys from a lot of uh, our fellow universities, those entering universities have an even higher rate of vaccination. Further still, uh, the vaccination rate for that young 18 to 39 population is increasing by about 1% per week. So I think we are on the right track, but we're using this measure to urge, encourage, uh, and really uh, ask young people in particular, but also our staff and faculty who are not yet vaccinated to get the vaccine. It is our greatest protection against the uh, uh, virus, including the variants. The other thing, of course, factoring into our decision is access to vaccines. As you know, and I see there are a couple of comments in the chat function, Access to vaccines was absolutely critical before any mandating of vaccines was possible. And I mean access not for you and I who live in large cities. I mean all of the various communities across Ontario needed to have access to vaccines, ready access, as did all of different age groups. As we've watched that and we've watched the uptake in vaccines and we've seen uh, greater access, it then became possible for us to mandate vaccines without arguing, without uh, leading to uh, creating a two-tier system where some people had access and others didn't. Now with the widespread access to the vaccine, we're able to uh, be sure that people have that access and we can play a role in making sure they have that access. Finally, the university is mitigating risk. We can't guarantee the elimination of all risk. We never have been able to uh, for any uh, disease. We're trying our best to mitigate risk as much as possible. We're following public health guidelines. We are in many cases exceeding uh, many uh, of the steps 
uh, of uh, other institutions. But what we're trying to do is keep our campus safe in the best way we know possible. And that is by combining vaccination, in this case, mandating vaccines with continued public health measures, masking, hand washing, social distancing, respect for one another in a, in a working and learning environment in ways that will keep us safe, which then takes us to, I will answer the question before Aaron poses it, about, uh, I know I can see there's a lot of question about how we're enforcing this. In the days ahead, we will be clarifying many of the uh, exact details of how we'll be doing this. But right now, uh, we are uh, using this as mandating vaccines through an attestation by individuals on campus. And that attestation will go through uh, an online portal where we will gather aggregate data. We must protect the privacy and uh, of others. And for that reason, we are aggregating the data so that we can track uh, levels of vaccination, but in fact, not be privy to your own individual information. Attestation means that there is a, a voluntary and a public health uh, kind of educational component to compliance. Like many regulations, we're not going to be, except in egregious cases, actively enforcing. We are not going to become a carding campus. I am not asking TAs, graduate students, researchers, faculty to enforce. And that's what this would come down to unless we can get an easy mechanism such as a vaccine passport. So for the moment, uh, we are not, we are investigating all possible options. We will be diving into the details in the days to come. But right now, uh, we are using voluntary compliance and this is aimed at behavioral change. We have many, many instances across Canada and across history to show that this can work. Uh, we've already been incredibly successful at getting high rates of vaccination in our community through public health measures, uh, through persuasion, through um, scientific evidence. We will continue to use those measures, but with a doubling down of saying that we do expect you to be vaccinated if you come onto campus. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, President Yates. Yeah, the enforcement uh, question came up quite a few times, so thank you for addressing that. Um, the next uh, two questions, we're actually going to bundle them together for uh, for Dr. Tenenbaum. Um, so there's a pair of questions. So the first one is, when will under 12 age group be able to have access to vaccines? Uh, and then the second one is about transmissibility. So they're asking a question about if they catch the virus, how likely is it that they could still pass it on to someone, uh, even if they too have been vaccinated? Thanks, Aaron. So I'll address both of those in order. The first one being about vaccinations for those under 12. This is a really important area for us to be keeping an eye on because we know that given how easily transmitted Delta is and given how high levels of coverage we need to be in our community to really approach herd immunity, we need to have as many people eligible as possible and a sizable chunk of our population is under age 12 and therefore not currently eligible. We know that the key vaccine manufacturers are in various stages of doing clinical trials to make sure that they have something they can offer that is effective and safe in those younger age groups. I think we're expecting to see some of that data in the coming months as they submit it, for example, to Health Canada and to the other agencies like Health Canada around the world. And we don't have a timeline of exactly when the vaccine will be available to go into people's arms locally. But I know we're going to have many updates over the fall as we begin to hear about the outcomes of these trials and perhaps hear about the production of these vaccines and when they might be available within our community. So more to come on that. And I, I imagine we'll be communicating as public health a lot about that as we learn more. But we are optimistic that we will have something in the next coming months. The next question uh, that you asked, Darren, is about uh, the transmissibility of, of the Delta variant. And we know that Delta is much more transmissible than what we've dealt with in the past. You know, for most of the pandemic, we've been dealing with a, with a form of COVID that was at risk of overwhelming some of our healthcare capacity. That was before the VOCs came into the picture. Uh, the, earlier this calendar year, we had the Alpha variant, as it's now known, that was about one and a half times as easily transmitted as the previous form of COVID. And that led to our third wave, which we can all remember in recent history. Delta is thought to be at least another uh, one and a half times as transmissible as that alpha variant. So we're looking at something which has a very high R value. It's very easily transmitted from person to person and one person with the infection can pass it on to other people. We know that people who are vaccinated 
are at much lower risk of getting the infection if they're exposed to someone who's a case of COVID-19. We know that people who are vaccinated are a very small fraction of the cases that we see. We do see occasional breakthrough cases, as they're called, meaning cases among those who are vaccinated, but they are rare. And those cases happen because the, no vaccine is perfect. And as long as COVID exists in our community, there is always some risk. But the vaccine dramatically reduces that risk that you face if you happen to be in contact with someone who has COVID. And that's a critically important thing to know. We also have evidence as we learn more about exactly how much being vaccinated reduces your risk of passing the infection on if you happen to have it. We're learning a lot more at places in the US, for example, where they're having outbreaks. The science in that is evolving, but we know that overall being vaccinated dramatically reduces your risk of having COVID and reduces your risk of being part of a chain of transmission that can lead to further community spread. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Tenbaum, appreciate it. Um, the next question goes back to uh, President Yates. Uh, this person is wondering about visitors to campus, for example, pr prospective students and their families on campus tours, open house events, etc. And if the vaccine mandate applies to them and how would this be enforced or regulated? Thanks very much, Aaron, and I'll start and then I'll pass it over to uh, Vice President Rashid. So um, we're working through, we're currently working through the details uh, of the protocols uh, that we need to have in place to keep the campus safe uh, with visitors. And I say we're working through this because you can imagine that uh, there are many children that visit our campus. We can't possibly require them as they're not eligible for the vaccine. So we must work through the various uh, different types of visitors who we do expect to come to campus and we will be developing protocols. We will be encouraging all those people. Uh, uh, we, clear, we continue to encourage all people on our campus, off our campus to get the vaccine. And we will continue to communicate that. The best protection of everybody is to get the vaccine. But we are working on those protocols and maybe uh, Dr. Rash uh, Vice President Rashid, uh, I will turn it over to you. I'm sure. Thank, Thank you, Charlotte. Um, so as Charlotte said, we're working through the details and um, vaccination for all visitors on campus and are considering it. However, we do know that um, we will be using the screening tool for vaccine to indicate whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated or um, chose not to answer the question. And we are expecting all visitors on campus to complete those screening tools and um, they will have that opportunity to um, complete that question on the vaccination. More details on whether um, this will be mandatory for visitors, especially coming indoors of our facility will be coming out later but we're working through the details on that. Great, thank you so much. Vice President Rashid, well, since you're already talking, we have another question for you that's come up here. Uh, with vaccinations now becoming mandatory, will masking still be mandatory on campus? Um, thanks, Aaron. Yes, all safety measures that are in place um, uh, according to public health are still required on campus. That is, includes hand hygiene, mask and physical distance as if you're able to as much as possible and if in especially indoors if you're outdoors and you're unable to be physically apart um, masks will be expected to be worn as well especially if we're having events with large group of people you will be required to wear masks we also will have ppp available for people who require them based on their roles um, that they're performing whether that's the eye protection um, or otherwise Great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is coming is for uh, for Kate Dewey, uh, acting provost. Uh, now that the university has mandated the vaccines, how does the university plan to accommodate international students arriving into Canada who perhaps didn't have access to vaccines? And will there be a buffer period before this mandate comes into effect since it would take at least a month for some to get fully vaccinated? Thank you. So um, certainly international students coming to Canada will have to follow the 14 day isolation period um, as, um, as all international uh, arrivees to Canada do. The, um, we're expecting that some students may be vaccinated. Um, they may not have two vaccines and, and they could certainly be coming from a country where the vaccine's not been available. We will have the vaccine available on our campus 
for any student coming, um, and, and staff, I would say, students, staff, and faculty who, who haven't been able to be vaccinated, um, you're able to get the vaccine at Student Health Services. And, um, and we will uh, not only help international students through the self-isolation process, but we'll also ensure that they have um, access to the vaccine. Um, as we are um, uh, planning our uh, vaccinate the mandatory vaccination um, process. Um, we would expect that students would get, um, the, if they're not vaccinated, would get the vaccine as soon as they arrive on campus and would get their booster as soon as they're eligible for a booster. So at, as soon as possible, we will have all students uh, vaccinated if, if they're um, eligible and do not have a reason to be accommodated. Great, and thank you, um, Provost Dude. There's also a follow-up question to that. I guess we can kind of bundle. So also, there uh, we're getting questions about what resources are available to students who miss in-person classes or labs when needing to self-isolate or quarantine if they're exposed to the COVID-19 virus. Um, realistically, if we think about students um, who have illness, um, uh, probably for as long as the university has been open, we've had issues um, to deal with with students who are ill and not able to go to class. And so our current protocols for students who are not able to go to class um, do not differ from, um, in, will not differ in September um, according to what we've done in the past. So examples of what students have done, uh, perhaps they get notes from a classmate, um, for faculty members who um, who have um, ha who are posting their PowerPoint presentations or posting um, their their lectures, students will have access to that. And um, and if students are ill and not able to make an uh, do a complete an assignment or a midterm, then they will have to um, ask for um, accommodation from their faculty member, um, just as they've done in the past. Well, Provost Dewey, you're very popular. We have another question for you. <laughs> Let's just come in as well. <laughs> They're fast and furious. Um, what will happen to uh, to on-campus classes if another lockdown happens? Well, if we have another lockdown um, and we're not able to be um, on campus, I think that we will have to um, uh, pivot if people are not too upset with that word. I think it still fits. Um, pivot to remote um, courses. Um, it it is definitely not something. Uh, I mean, obviously, we all hope that that doesn't happen. And and as I said before, we're hoping for a robust um, uh, fall semester on campus. Um, but if we're told by the province that we're not able to be on campus anymore, or not able to be in face-to-face -face classes anymore, those that don't have exceptions uh, will have to pivot. Um, as probably many people on on this call uh, recognize, um, there have been in the past exceptions for parts of programs where uh, maybe students still have their labs um, if there's mandatory parts of a course where you have to be face to face. So hopefully um, something like that would happen. But if we're talking about um, lectures, we would likely likely have to pivot to remote delivery. Great, thank, thank you so much. And um, I, I just wanted to thank everyone too for submitting their questions. Um, our team had been working fast and furious to try to answer as many of them as they can. And there's obviously gonna be some that we didn't get a chance to, uh, to address in real time live here today. But as I mentioned off the top, they're gonna be answering questions in the chat. And then we're also gonna be posting a Q and A on our COVID website for all the questions that weren't answered. So we are really uh, attempting to answer everything that's come through and uh, we're making a really concerted effort to, uh, to do that. Um, if you do have any new questions as well, and you, we have a uh, website from the Return to Work uh, site, which uh, will be put in the chat as well. Um, it's r2w at uaguelph.ca, and you'll find that in the chat where you can send an email to if you have a, another question. Um, you can also even uh, use our central social media channels and we'll be forwarded to the right person. So there's lots of opportunities for you for you to ask.
Um, so before we uh, hand it off to President Yates uh, for some uh, closing remarks, I just wanted to uh, again thank uh, Dr. Tannenbaum for his ongoing support for the university uh, and for the uh, entire Guelph community. Uh, I wanted to also thank our uh, leadership team uh, for coming out today and uh, making yourself available to uh, answer all the questions. I'm sure our community really appreciates the transparency and uh, as you can imagine, everybody has a lot of questions about what's happening. Uh, so I think these kind of events are really helpful to, uh, to make uh, people uh, feel much more comfortable. Uh, so I want to introduce uh, President Yates once again for some uh, final words. Thanks very much, Aaron, and I apologize. I was getting caught up and trying to read all the uh, Q and A. There's a lot there, and I know that uh, we'll be taking those questions back as we continue to discuss, plan, and figure out the details of this. So uh, rest assured, everything you say to us, uh, we're listening, and also we're trying to figure out the answers. Uh, we, we don't have all the answers. I know nobody has all the answers. And fortunately for us, by working collaboratively with those across campus, but also with our colleagues in the public health, uh, we're much closer uh, to doing a, a better and better job. So I just want to say, uh, echo Aaron's thank you to all of you for joining us today to take the time, but also for all the questions. Uh, they're incredibly helpful. And Dr. Tannenbaum, thank you uh, again for uh, willingly giving us uh, some of your time. I know how busy you are at public health uh, to support the university and the broader Guelph community in this. Um, you can expect more details on the vaccine mandate, on ventilation and the expert pan and, and uh, various other issues in the days ahead. Um, and so please keep your eye out and we'll try and keep you in as informed as possible. I want to close on a more personal note just to say thank you all. I know this is a stressful time and I next know the next few months will be an important part of us kind of coming to terms with what we've been going through uh, and how we move forward. Uh, that's an important part uh, of of restoring us uh, to the community uh, we are and we want to continue to be. And I promise you that we're, I'm working hard on that uh, and I look forward to seeing you talking to you about those issues. Uh, we've responded to an incredible number of challenges this year in a large part because of all of you. Uh, the staff, the faculty, the students have uh, accommodated, have been flexible, have shown support for one another and unwavering dedication to the University of Guelph and I want to say thank you and I share uh, with you in that dedication. I'm confident that we can meet uh, each and every new challenge that comes our way. I know it's difficult, I know people are tired, so I hope that you will enjoy uh, some of the rest of the summer and I look forward to seeing you in the fall. Thank you, take care and thanks for joining us and uh, we will be keep an eye out just in case we decide to have yet another uh, town hall. I think as we go forward, as we get closer to the fall, it's quite likely that we will have another town hall, but we will continue to communicate. So thank you, have a nice day and thanks to everybody who participated on the call today. Uh, your commitment, uh, I appreciate, and the answers you've given. And if you require any further information, please, or you have other questions, please feel free to uh, send them, including to the president's email. I'll make sure that we get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks very much. Have a nice day.